Yeah, so the main idea behind these uh, workshops and tutorials is just to give everyone a, a good idea of how to use like some open source programs to solve things uh, in biology. And, and also, um, you know, the reason we're sort of starting with this one in particular is because there's a few groups who are in interested in using it uh, for their research. And it's also a good one in terms of there's a lot of troubleshooting to, to get started. So, I mean, when it initially came out, it was quite easy to use, but in more recent updates, it's actually very challenging for someone who's a new user to actually be able to, to do this process. So we'll go through some of the sort of like theory behind the imaging and then get right into like installing the pipeline and go all the way through to analyzing some data. Um, so in 2016, um, this paper came out in Cell. I'm sure everyone here is aware of it and probably have read it. Um, There's a really fantastic paper because it showed a complete pipeline from you know really good clearing, cell analysis, and then mapping. Um, and, and what was great about it was they were very transparent in, in every step. So they really showed uh, you know how to do the clearing protocol very well, and they also showed everything in terms of the analysis. Christoph Kirst, who did a lot of the analysis pipeline, shared everything on GitHub and was actually quite generous in like helping people to, to use it properly. Um, and essentially, you can take brains, as you know, clear them using iDisco Plus, and then map the CFOS positive cells in this program that was called uh, ClearMap at the time, um, and then do these activity maps and, and, and do t-tests to compare like different voxels inside the brains. Um, and I, I guess first I just wanted to touch on like what, why it's useful to use a light sheet for this. Uh, you know, with uh, wide field imaging or you know any sort of imaging where you're, you're sort of illuminating and, and imaging back through the objective, you have this kind of volume inside the sample that you're illuminating and, and you're seeing things in focus in the focal plane, but there's a lot of um, contamination from things above and below the focal plane. And at the same time, you're also illuminating all of this. So you're actually bleaching a lot of the volume as, as you go. And so very large volumes like whole brains become impractical because of, because of this problem. Um, and so light sheet imaging is really nice because it, it, one of the main reasons is it decouples the illumination from the, the emission. So we can excite from, from the side of the sample, but you know, image from above. And that gives us this ability to have a very thin optical section and also avoids illuminating you know, the sample that we're not actually imaging. We can try and get a good optical section using confocal imaging. And this is still a very fantastic technique for doing optical sectioning, but it, it has the same problem of like, of illuminating a whole volume that we're actually not trying to image. Um, but there's another really important factor for the light sheet, and that is, you know, and you sort of come across this a lot with, you know, spinning disc or confocal imaging. To get a really good optical section, you need to use an objective with a high numerical aperture. And so the numerical aperture is a, is a really important number on the objective. So, um, you know, on an objective, you'll always see the magnification and you'll always see the numerical aperture. And the numerical aperture gives you an indication of the objective's resolution, or also the brightness, but also this sort of depth of field and, and your ability to get a, a, you know, what sort of size the optical section will be. And if you want to get a thin optical section using a, a low magnification objective, it's actually very difficult because they're, they're usually very low numerical apertures. So you have a large field of view, but a very um, dim sort of sample and a very large depth of field. Uh, and so the sort of opposing thing is to use a sort of higher numerical aperture objective, say like the 20 times objective. This will give you a small depth of field, so it's easier to count these dense cells, but you end up with a very small um, field of view. And so by using a light sheet, we can control this um, optical section by using a thin sheet of light, but then use a low magnification and sometimes low numerical aperture objective to get this large field of view. Um, and so this is another one of these key sort of advantages. Um, because, you know, a lot of times people, you know, they might think to try and get a very high resolution image, but in fact, you don't need a particularly high resolution image. You just need to be able to resolve things like cells within a few voxels clearly. And so having a high sort of lateral resolution is not really required. And so for us at the Zuckerman Institute, we have um, one of these ultra microscope two light sheet microscopes, which are used by a lot of the um, whole brain imaging groups. And this is the same type of microscope that was used in, in the cell paper. Um, 
And I'm just pointing out, we, we have this 2x objective that's used by a lot of labs. We also have a correction cap. Many people um, worry a bit about these objectives because their image has a lot of distortion. But with a correction cap like we have, there's very little distortion. And I'll show you some images to sort of get an idea of how this correction cap works. And the other thing to keep in mind is it works best between two and four times uh, zoom. Um, and so before we sort of get into the whole ClearMap pipeline, I just wanted to touch on a few things briefly, um, just to sort of think about, you know, how to get a good image for doing this mapping. And that's to, um, you know, how much of the camera sensor to use, whether to use dynamic focusing or not, um, some sort of ideas about image quality and magnification, and then how to save time during acquisitions. So the first one, you know, this is actually discussed in the cell paper. We are with this sort of field of view of the, the whole camera, there's actually a, a large area that's not so good for imaging. So when you're imaging on the light sheet, you shouldn't really use the whole field of view. You should crop down uh, to a smaller field of view. And this is kind of this green rectangle is kind of where they were sort of discussing is, is good in the paper. And we can image a little bit bigger than this because of our correction cap, but this is a good sort of guideline. Um, this sort of height of this region is about 1500 pixels. So if you're sort of trying to draw this out on the light sheet, this should be 1500 pixels high. Um, I'll have some notes on this later. And then you can go roughly the full width of the image on our system. And, and just, you know, if you're ever on the light sheet and you're trying to figure out where you should draw a field of view, maybe you're working on a different light sheet or you're working on some different parameters, it's really good to just check for yourself. And a good way to do this is to find um, some, you know, get things in focus, get make sure the light sheet is sort of um, focused on that part of the tissue, and then try moving those uh, cells around. And so here's just a, a patch of cells. Um, if I move the, the image down a little bit so that that patch is sort of now on the bottom of the screen, you can see why we try to avoid using this, this bottom part of the sensor. Um, and vice versa, if I go to the top, you can see again, like these cells really just start to disappear. And that's why if you're using, you know, this for quantitative analysis, you really should avoid using these regions of, of the camera. Um, and you can see here, like just going from to the right, you know, things are actually pretty good here. This could almost be just like where the light sheet is positioned and to the left as well. We still get to see pretty much all of these cells. So that's kind of the process you could go through. Um, the other thing to, to really think about when you're doing these experiments is how the light sheet is focusing into the sample. You know, people always give these illustrations of how the light sheet is looking inside the sample, but the reality is um, much different, especially on the system we're using to, to get a very high resolution light sheet. Um, you know, so basically having a very thin optical section in the sample here there's actually a, a very it's a really only a very narrow part of the image so this is even a bit of an exaggeration it would be narrower than this and on either side of that um you don't really know how thick the sheet is but it's a lot thicker it can be like tens of microns or more so what happens is inside this area where the sheet is focused you'll get very fine sharp puncture of the cells but outside that you'll get very diffuse blurry labeling and, and often you'll miss cells and so really, you need to make sure that you're using this um, area for, for your imaging. And the, and the way to do this is to use dynamic focusing. And this is really where we just sweep the sheet horizontally through the sample. And the, the image is a lot better in terms of being able to detect these cells. And I can sort of show you a comparison of this just so you have a, this clear in, in your mind. This is um, you know, without using dynamic focus, and this is using dynamic focus. So you can see if you were trying to analyze cells in this image, you have a really hard time of, of getting, you know, as many as that really were there. Um, Luke, may I ask a question or do you want to save the questions to the end? Uh, no, that's okay. You can ask a question. So my question is, what about using multiple sheets? Yeah, actually, so uh, actually, actually, this is probably going to be more clear at the end. So uh, I'm going to show you some parameters and then we'll discuss like a really fast way of dealing with this. Okay. Um, I, I think it's always good too to have uh, in your mind what the data looks like in uh, current papers. Um, and so this is from the, the 2016 paper, you know, imaging sagittally using dynamic focus, just taking some some regions of interest. 
and you can see, you know, there is a bit of distortion in the images, um, you know, especially t towards the top and bottom where we have, we, we know we have this issue. And they sort of talk about this in, in the paper. This is really the area where you can get good um, quantification. The cell detection is like reasonably robust if there's some distortion because you're just finding these bright 3D maxima. But if they're too distorted, you may end up getting double counts. So this is something that's important to think about. Um, just so you have an idea of how things look like on our system, this, this brain is a little bit more faint, but um, you can see that we don't have as much of this kind of um, radial distortion that, that was in the original paper without the correction cap. And just in terms of like parameters for imaging like this, so in this paper, um, you know, they're using the 2x objective with a, a, a 0.8x zoom, so about 1.x total magnification. Um, and they use dynamic focusing to do about 20 positions through the sample. Um, and this takes about 45 minutes to do one hemisphere. The reason we're sort of doing this with hemispheres is if you try to do the whole brain, um, you can use both light sheets, but you end up in a situation where if you're just using one light sheet, it's very hard to get good quality uh, images of the cells all the way across to the far side of the, of the brain. So imaging sagittally and just doing one hemisphere at a time is a, a good way to get very high quality data. Um, and I'll discuss a little bit more about, oh, so here, um, oh, this is really just showing if, if you want really good data for the whole brain, you should use these two tiles rather than just one tile, because we know that if we use the full region of interest, we're going to have distortions at the top and bottom. So really you need two tiles to do this. Um, you know, in the paper, they talk a little bit about using a higher magnification and it's not really useful because even at this 1.x magnification, you can really see all the cells and they occupy enough, enough voxels that they're discrete from each other. Um, and just zooming in really just adds more voxels. It's not really important. Um, but the other consideration is uh, the optics on the system and, and the way this objective works, especially with the, the dipping cap and, and using this sort of variable magnification, is the image quality is a lot better when you use a little bit of zoom. And so um, it's true that there, there's you know maybe unnecessary pixels, but the actual sharpness and, and quality of the image is, is far superior. And so this is an image just using the, one, the 0.8 zoom. And on the right is using the 2x zoom. And you can see there's a, there's a little bit of drift between these images, but it's roughly the same area. And you can see a lot more cells more clearly present. And this, this means the analysis is a lot easier as well. Um, and so you may feel that, okay, using zoom is kind of necessary if I want to get really good data. Um, and if you try and approach this by using dynamic focusing, um, you know, so here we're using the 4x zoom, it's going to take you about four hours to get uh, a high resolution, good quality data set of just one hemisphere. And maybe that's okay, but maybe that's really going to take too long for, for your project and you're thinking about costs and things like that. And so um, there's another way to think about these, this imaging, and this is something that um, they talk about in, some, in the tube map paper, but also um, Marcella from uh, Rui Costa's lab is using a technique like this to image in a, um, a much faster way, but still get very high quality data. Um, and so instead of trying to sweep the sheet through the brain, which we know is, this is just a very slow process. Repositioning the sheet takes much longer than it should. Um, and this is just a, the way the instrument is. And so instead of doing that, we know that if we park the sheet in one position, we get a region that's of good quality. So why not just crop to where we know is of good quality and then just zip through a Z stack of that region and then move to the next tile. Um, and so if we do that, um, and, and you know, this is something you might have to sort of investigate yourself, but uh, you, you know, by just looking at the data uh, on the left here, this is 2X with two times zoom. So total 4X magnification with, with dynamic focusing on. Um, and this is with dynamic focusing off. And so actually within this sort of 700 pixel width, the image quality is pretty good. After this, it very quickly starts to drop off where the sheet's getting thicker. And if we just overlay these, um, you know, if you zoom in and actually check cell by cell, you're really getting all, every cell with, uh, with either approach. And so this is a really nice because we can forego the, the dynamic focusing, but still image with this higher magnification and, and higher image quality. Um, and so, this is kind of this um, paradigm here on the sort of far right, this 2x fast. So it's using total 4x magnification, 
really high image quality, no dynamic focus, using this sort of smaller ROI. And you, you know, you need to do more tiles. So four to four by five or five by five to get a whole hemisphere. But this imaging takes, you know, less than an hour because you're really just zipping through tile by tile. Um, and, 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 you know, special thanks for Marcella, both, both for sharing her samples with me so I could get some of these images and also, you know, these discussions on what is a useful imaging paradigm. Um, and another thing to point out actually is, you know, everyone's sort of using this three micron step. Um, and this is to make sure that you have a number of planes where the cell is visible, but you can actually sacrifice a little bit more on the step size and still see every single cell. So this is something if you're really trying to shave off some time, there is a little bit of play in the, in the Z step size that you can use. And finally, just so you can save more time, you don't need to use these parameters that you're using for CFOS for the autofluorescence, because ultimately when we're mapping to the uh, template brain, the template brain is 25 by 25 by 25 microns. So that, that's, that's the resolution you need to be able to map into this atlas. And so imaging higher than that is kind of being just a little bit excessive. And so we, we definitely don't need three microns. You can cut it down to you know six to 10 microns Z step size. You can zoom out and get the whole thing done in one to two fields. And that way you can image the autofluorescence in five to 10 minutes very quickly. And that way we have suitable data for the alignment, but then we have high quality data for the detection of the CFOS positive cells. Um, actually, and one other thing to point out, if you want to get a little bit better image for this autofluorescence mapping, it actually helps to open up the, the light sheet. So rather than using this high resolution sheet, make the sheet a little bit thicker. So reduce the numerical aperture and that will make the optical section thicker. You'll be able to see more of the sort of changes in autofluorescence for the different brain regions um, to help with the mapping and you still use this large step size. Yeah, so if you have any questions about these, I'm happy to answer them later, but I just thought it'd be helpful to sort of compare these in a table. Um, and then and finally, before we dive into the analysis, just so everyone's clear on, on, on how this process works, um, for, for all of these kind of whole brain analysis pipelines, what we're doing is performing analysis in a common coordinate framework. And, and, and what that is, is having a, a, a template brain. So this is in the case of the Allen Atlas, this is a, you know, over a thousand um, brains that have been imaged with uh, two photon. So we're looking at the autofluorescence and the, an average brain has been made of these. And then they do sort of like a parcel, parcelization where they sort of every single voxel, voxel is assigned to a different brain region. And once you have an atlas like this, you can take an experimental brain, so a brain that you image on the light sheet, and as long as you've got an autofluorescence or a DAPI image or something that has similar contrast uh, patterns to this uh, autofluorescence, you can downsample the autofluorescence of your experimental brain to the same resolution as this template brain and perform a, uh, a registration. And to make sure that the cells or the projections or, or whatever you're looking at um, also map into this space, you can just make sure that these cells are, are aligned to the autofluorescent channel. And that way, any cell that's detected in this volume, we can say, okay, it's in this voxel. That voxel has got a certain ID number. That, that ID is striatum, so that, that cell is in the striatum. And we can also make measurements of fluorescence intensity or the density of projections and a whole lot of uh, useful things. And because we're doing it in a common coordinate framework, we can compare individuals and compare groups. So it's a really powerful way of doing any kind of analysis in, in organs. Okay, so um, yeah, you, I know you had that question about the uh, light sheets from either side, Eleanor, do, do you still wanna discuss that or is this okay? found that table very helpful. Great, okay. Yeah. Okay, so what I'll do is uh, I'll stop sharing and then I'll share. So we might, I might need a little feedback a little bit to see if you can see everything clearly, but what I'm gonna do is connect into the uh, Linux workstation that we have ClearMap running on and I'll, I'll take you through all the steps to, to get it working and, and, and I'll analyze a brain. So, So we actually have ClearMap installed on a Linux workstation at the Institute. And if you're interested in using that, I can 
share the details and get you signed up so that you can use it and you can you know use it remotely um, or use it in person now um, and I know some of you have your own workstation so if you're having trouble with like getting a clear map pipeline to work hopefully this will help but you can also reach out afterwards and we can try and troubleshoot So the, you know, the, the first thing to think about whenever you use any of these um, open source pipelines, so we can just go to So any of these pipelines that are shared on GitHub, you know, we can download the code from here directly. Um, If you're doing anything like this, it's always good to look around and see what documentation is available. So ClearMap actually has pretty good documentation for this, but there's actually a lot of errors um, that, I mean, I think, you know, this sort of, I don't think this is malicious or anything like that. Christoph Kurs is a very generous person and has shared a lot of analysis pipelines. I think this is more the problem of, you know, postdocs really trying to move forward with their career and, and not having, you know, trying not to spend too much time getting bogged down in and supporting too intensively and not be able to make progress. And so th this comes up quite a lot where there's a pipeline that's shared, it might work at the beginning, but then it doesn't work or it doesn't really work for other people. And there's reasons because it's it's just complicated and no one's had time to document it properly. Um, but hopefully like this this tutorial actually helps you resolve a lot of this stuff. Um, but yeah, always check the, the documentations here. The other thing that's really useful is look in the issues. So there's a tab here for issues. You know, if you're having a problem, other people are probably having a problem too. And a lot of times if you spend some time in here digging through how people have solved things, you'll, you'll find that you can get something working. Um, okay, so what I won't go through directly is, you know, to get this working, you'll need to have Anaconda installed. That's a very simple process. Um, you just need to download Anaconda and install it. Um, then download ClearMap, which we have done. Uh, and then a lot of times when you're working in Python, uh, you know, through Anaconda, you want to build an environment and an environment is sort of like a separate instance of the um, Python or whatever tool you're, you're using with specific dependencies. So there's a whole lot of different, um, you know, dependencies that uh, like pipelines need. So ClearMap uses NumPy and a whole lot of other different tools to be able to operate. And there's many different versions of those. And so if you just install all these things, but some of the versions are wrong, everything breaks. And so the way to get these things to work well is to create an environment for them. And so uh, a lot of stuff we're going to do, we're going to do through a, a terminal um, in, in Linux. You can, this actually works also in Mac OS for the clear map, at least the original Mac OS. Um, but it, there's a few things in this pipeline that really to work well, you really need to be running it on Linux. And so, you know, well, yeah. Don't try and do this on Windows because you'll definitely run into a few a few challenges that'll be very hard to resolve. Um, so to start with, like to create a, an environment, you can um, look. You can just cr create one fresh, um, but you can also use an environment file. And so in um, the folder here, you can see there's a a, a, a YML file here. Um, this is an environment file. Um, I can actually even open this. Okay. Edit this. Just so you can see what's inside. So if you open up one of these files, it, it just shows you that what to install. So if we're creating an environment, um, it needs to install Python and then it needs to install all of these things to, to be able to work. Um, if, you, if you try and install it with this original environment, it, it, it doesn't work. Um, but sometimes pipelines will share what's called a stable environment. So this is kind of an environment um, that copies everything that the, was on the person's sort of computer's environment and their exact versions. And so if we looked in this one, 
Um, I'll just quickly show you as well. Then what you get is a very specific. And so now you can see like every single different um, library and, and, and what version it has to be to make sure that it works. And hopefully like if you inst install this way, then you'll get something that um, works. And if not, you can start to uninstall and reinstall some of these individual um, libraries. And so to create an environment, um, we can just type in here, create, and we can, and then what we could do is then just tell it the location of this of this file. In fact, on um, if I on Linux, you can actually just copy a file, and generally it'll let you paste the whole the whole path to a, if it's going to let me. That's not going to let me. So you can actually give it the location of that file. And, you, and we would need to give it a, an environment name. So. Bear with me a second. <clears throat> Yeah, so if we're, if we're going to do this, if we were in, um, so this is the sort of, you know, but what you would write basically would be, oh, it's not going to let me copy it. Yeah, so something like this. So we have Conda environment create, we give it a name. And then we put the the path to the file name, and so you know rather than doing this now because it'll take some time to do, I'll just actually open up our our existing um, environment that we we use, and if you ever want to see like um, what the environment is called or you forget what what you named it when you installed it, you can just type in conda and list, and this will actually list the um, different environments that you have installed. So if I go into um, the clear map environment, I can just say Conda, um, activate, and then I can type in our environment. And so now we're actually in this environment where clear map is installed and all the dependencies are installed and, and we know that, it, that, it's, that it's functioning. Um, well, one thing that I had to do, I'm not sure if this will be the case if you try and install it yourself, but one thing that I had to do directly after um, creating the environment with the clear map stable environment file was uninstalling and reinstalling spider. So spider is a program that I'm going to show you in a second that we use to sort of edit the script and run the script. And so to, to do that, if you have trouble is just to type in tip uninstall spider. If I run this, it's going to uninstall that, that program. And then I can just type in pip install spider and that will install the newest version of spider. Um, and because I've already done that, I'm just going to run Spider. So you can just run Spider by just typing in Spider. And, and, and this is what um, Spider looks like. So over on the left hand side, can everyone actually maybe what I'll do first is I'll just make the font a little bit bigger. Can everyone see that more clearly now? Is that okay? Just uh, yeah. If you have trouble seeing what I'm doing, just please let me know, and we'll, we'll try and make some changes. Um, okay, so we've got Spider running. What I'm going to do is get the original script. So this is the script that um, they provide inside the like clear map um, documents. Um, that we so this is the stuff that we downloaded directly from GitHub. So this is the clear map, uh, the cell map script just here for doing the cell analysis. They, they also have a um, Jupyter notebook version. 
but um, I haven't been able to get this to work very well. So, I mean, sometimes people are more comfortable. If you're used to using Jupyter Notebooks, it's tempting to use this, but I'm not sure if you can actually get through the whole pipeline with this successfully. So hopefully after you go through this, you'll see that Spider is not too intimidating and um, it's actually fairly easy to run. So if I open up the script for this, So, you know, if you're not used to working in Python and you don't, you sort of always doing things in, in GUIs, like seeing this kind of stuff can, you know, make you want to run for the hills. But what we're going to do is just go through step by step so that um, hopefully it's very clear what's happening and also what to change to make these things work. Um, so at the very top of the script is just some information um, about the script, who wrote it. And then at the very beginning here, we're getting into loading in clear map and then telling it where the data is stored so that we can start processing a brain. So this, this script is really designed for processing one, one brain. Um, you know, before we get started, one thing that's very useful in here is to actually just tell Python where your working directory is. Um, and you can do that by using a library called sys um, and then the, the directory we want to point it to is um, the directory where um, ClearMap is installed. And so from, for us, uh, in, in our case, I've got this installed in this directory here. So this just makes sure that whenever we're saying look for something, it's going to look for it in this directory. And so if you're having any errors or you just can't get past the first step, sometimes just making sure that this this pathway is correct, it is very helpful. Um, the next step here is actually just importing everything for ClearMap. Um, you know, the way to look at these, um, it's saying from ClearMap environment, import everything. And if, if you just want to see like what that means, um, we can go into the folder where I have ClearMap installed. Um, actually, maybe I'll just even open it directly. So I have it installed just here. So there's a, fi a file here, environment. So if I open this up, you can see that it, when this file runs, it just imports everything that's in ClearMap. So it's importing the workspace, it's importing some stuff for visualization, for processing, for alignment. So it basically just imports all the modules that were written in ClearMap so that it can start to process the data. Okay, so the first thing that we need to do is actually tell it the directory that our data is in. Um, and so I have the data that was used in the clear map paper and it's copied here. Um, if I go into the folder, now here, here's a folder. Um, what I'm going to do is I'm just going to get rid of all the analysis stuff. Oops. Um, and what it, some of these folders actually had very long names. So if you know, if you want to try this yourself and you want to save a little bit of time, just rename the folder to something simple like autofluorescence and CFOS. In here, like we can actually, if you want to look at what the data looks like, a good trick, you know, we can open this up in Fiji. You can use virtual stack. Um, and that way you can open up an image that's, you know, 50 gigabytes or more, and it will open up almost instantly. And you can start to actually look at what the quality of the data looks like. Um, so this is what our CFOS data looks like. I'm oh, sorry, our autofluorescence. This is our CFOS data. Okay, so this is a CFOS data. If you want to copy a directory, um, again, we can just copy here as if we're copying the folder. And then we can go straight back into Spider and just select this directory and paste the directory of our data. <clears throat> the next thing is to tell it where the uh, different channels are located. So in our folders, we have autofluorescence and CFOS. So I just need to change this to CFOS. And this is auto F. Um, and then we need to tell it the, the names of the data inside. So this, you know, these names can be a little bit complicated and it could be the case for the data that you have from the light sheet. A good way to deal with this is just to select the image and then use F2. 
And that way you can just copy the, the file name here. And we can just paste it in here. Um, in Python, you know, so it, at the end here, we've got a Z and then we have four zeros. This is like the different um, slices through the data set. And so you, rather, you know, to be able to collect all the images in that folder, um, the naming sort of convention here is to use, use this to sort of indicate those, those four zeros that come after Z or the four numbers. And so when we're putting the file name in, we need to make sure that we keep that. So now it knows, okay, after the Z, there'll be four numbers and that's gonna be the sequential images. And also our files are actually called ome.tiff. Um, and these were captured at different times. So we need, these ones have a slightly different name. So I'm just going to paste this in here again. Just get rid of this. Okay, so we've got the directory, we've got the two data sets. Um, this is just it important, sort of basically creating a workspace for the, all the analysis that we're going to do. And the first step here that's, that's actually going to cause you some trouble is that it's it's set to be working in a debug mode, and we really don't want to be in this debug mode for at least for most of the pipeline. So if you're working from scratch, make sure you change this to false. And we can so in Python, uh, especially you know when you're working you know in Spider, these you're not just running the whole code at once. You're actually running code sort of step by step. And these are sort of broken up into sort of steps by um, a hash and then some percent signs here. So if I wanted to put this into a separate step, I could I could put a hash percent. And now if I to run this, I just press shift and enter. After you, you run this, <clears throat> you should see that you have your data in here. So maybe I'll just expand this a little bit so that you can see clearly. <laughs> Give me, bear with me for a second here. So hopefully you can see like this is the raw data, this is the autofluorescence data. So if you're having any problems where it can't find the data, um, maybe like this folder is, is wrong, or maybe you put a spelling mistake in here somewhere. If you run this, you're going to see no file, no file. So if you're, if you're not seeing the, the data load in properly, you know, check exactly what, what you've done here. It could be something simple, just like, a, you know, having a couple of letters wrong here, or it could, this is case sensitive. So even just having a, a capital letter instead of a lowercase will cause you some problems. So that's something just to pay attention, just so you can load the data in. Once you've loaded the data in, uh, we need to tell it what we're aligning to. So we could be doing a whole brain or we could just be doing a hemisphere. Um, so what we need to do is tell it exactly what we're aligning to. And the way to think about this, um, the best way is even just to have a look. So when you install, like when you download the clear map pipeline. Let me just go back in here. There's a folder called resources. And this is actually where the Atlas and um, the annotation files live. So the, the um, just so you can see, this is the autofluorescence data set that we align to. And they have it oriented the same way that they image in the brain. So they've, they sort of have the dorsal surface facing to the left. And you can see this is actually similar to how they've, they've imaged on the light sheet. If you're um, imaging uh, from a different angle, you need to make sure that um, you, you know, either you change this in the, in the folder or you, you change it in here. So what you could, you could do is change the orientation. So this orientation, if we just have it as one, two, three, this, this just means that, um, it's exactly the same orientation. So basically our raw data is in the same orientation as our template brain. If we needed to flip the X axis, so in, in this case, we wanted to flip the brain so that it was actually the dorsal surface on the right, 
what we could do is say uh, minus one, and that would flip the x-axis. Or if we needed to make it so that the cerebellum was on the top, we could do minus two. So that so in our case, we, we need to take it. If you left that as it was, you're going to have trouble processing the data. We need to take out that negative number. And you know, just so you know, if you need to, you know, if the data is actually, you know, at right angles to this, so maybe it's sort of, you know, the dorsal surface is on the very top of the image, you could change the, these numbers. So you could make the X axis um, actually sort of the Z, the Z axis by swapping the one and the three. So this orientation is how you sort of change the orientation of the template to match your data. And the, and the other important thing is the slicing. So if you're doing a hemisphere, you wanna make sure that you're not aligning to the whole brain. Um, and we're actually just aligning to the one hemisphere. And the way to do that, um, so this is x-axis, y-axis, and z-axis. If we look um, here, so x, y, and z. So right now it's slicing at zero to 256. So if you look just in the top left here, hopefully that's visible to you. This is the slice number. If you go all the way through, 256 is somewhere here. <clears throat> this is actually like a little bit into the other hemisphere. And the way that we do the registration is using a program called Elastics. And if you want a good result, you need to make sure that you're mapping to the template and the template is the same volume as your raw data. So if you try and map to a slightly larger template image, it's gonna stretch your um, data set to fit that larger volume. And that way all your cell locations and everything will be um, inaccurate. So if we just go through here, we can find like, if we look at our raw data, if I scroll through, it actually stops just at the edge of it. Like it's being cut directly in the middle. So this is really at the boundary of the two hemispheres. And so for us, we want to actually be, if I just go through here, you can see this is the point where it, you know, it's switching to the other hemisphere. So this really needs to be 228. So if you left it like this, you're probably going to end up with a, a result that's not so good. So putting in here 228, make sure that we're, we're slicing the template to fit exactly um, our raw data. The, these lines here are loading in the parameters. So this is, so the way that we do this is we align the CFOS channel to the autofluorescence channel. That way, if there's any drift in the um, light sheet, like maybe the sample moved a little bit or maybe some optics changed a little bit, by doing that registration, we're, we're making sure they're both exactly in the same space. <clears throat> and then we take the autofluorescent data and, and we map the template brain onto it. So we sort of basically align this data set to this data set. And we do that in two steps in a fine um, and then a sort of a B-spline. This B-spline is kind of more of an elastic registration with a sort of local stretching to fit very um, precisely. Um, so we need to run this by just pressing sh shift enter. And then the next step here is um, to convert the raw data <clears throat> Just changes. <clears throat> so we need to convert the TIFF files into a, a NumPy file. So the reason to do this is just so everything can run a lot faster. One of the good things about ClearMap is that it's very fast. So we're analyzing a, a whole brain. It can be, you know, it's several gigabytes at least to tens of gigabytes. Um, but the whole process can be over in like 20 to 30 minutes. Um, so these steps of just converting to NumPy, make sure that we can do all the um, rescaling fairly quickly and then all the um, cell detection processes very quickly. And so what it's doing here is just rescaling um, X and Y, and then you'll see it rescaling in Z, or sorry, converting into, sorry, converting into this NumPy format. So this takes a, a minute or two. Um, and then what we'll do is we'll rescale it. So we want to take our uh, data that was acquired on the light sheet, which is higher resolution, and scale it down to the, the resolution of the atlas. 
<clears throat> and this is kind of what I was talking about earlier on in the presentation. You don't, for, especially for the autofluorescence, we're going to scale it down to 25 by 25 by 25 anyway. So having a really high resolution for the autofluorescence is, is really unnecessary. Um, and, and it's important that these numbers are correct. So make sure that you know what your resolutions are at the light sheet. Th these two will be the, the lateral sampling size, so the pixel size in the image. Um, and this is the, this is the um, pixel size that was used in the paper, I'm pretty sure. Let me just double check. Yeah, so this is the, this is correct. And this is the step size. So whatever step size you use when you're acquiring the data, this will be the sort of Z resolution here. And the sync resolution is what we want it to be. So we're just telling it to be the 25 micron isotropic data set. Uh, so if I run this, it will start to process that data set. Um, the autofluorescence here, like the default sort of settings of the script um, are for a different type of data set. So you really need to make sure that you change this to match. So in the, the data set that is available online, these are captured at the same resolution. Hey, Luke. Yeah. Question. Can you, can you capture the autofluorescence at a different resolution? Will it then, um, what's the word, transform that data or the, the actual raw data that you're trying to count into the autofluorescence data? Basically, can you, can you capture the autofluorescence and the, uh, the CFOS, for instance, in different resolutions? To speed up yeah, the, uh, their, yeah. Uh, registration. Uh, absolutely, yeah, def and then that's that's what I would recommend because yeah, what we're doing here, you can see we're taking the CFOS data, we make it 25 microns isotropic, we're taking the autofluorescence data. I mean, so this this is just, just to make it clear, this is the CFOS, and then this is autofluorescence, um, and we're taking what it was captured at and we're turning it to 25 by 25. So these, these two can actually be different because ultimately they get scaled down to the, the same resolution. So as long as it's less than 25 by 25, um, that's okay. Um, you know, so, I mean, it's very, if, if you, even if you just capture it, like zoomed out and do a 10 micron step, it's gonna take like three minutes. So that's all, you know, you don't really need to go much faster than that. Um, How does that work though? Does it does it do a registration from the CFOS into the autofluorescence after the autofluorescence has already been registered to the atlas, or does it do something like that? Yeah, exactly. It actually does it first. So the first registration that we do, let me just run this. the The first registration that we do is an affine registration between the CFOS and the autofluorescence channels. Um, once they're at this, once they're both at twenty five microns isotropic. They, they will do that first registration so that the CFOS data and the um, autofluorescence data are in the same space. And so it, it doesn't matter necessarily what they were before because when you align them, they're both in the same um, resolution. So yeah, it, there could have been some drift. There could be, a, it could have been acquired at a different resolution. That's okay because we scale them to the same resolution and we, we align them together. So that's the first step. And the second step is aligning the autofluorescence to the template. Um, and that way, anything that was in the CFOS channel, like we know where it is based on the autofluorescence and, and where it is based on the template. Yeah, so you know, basically the short answer is yes, you can, you can do a different resolution here. Awesome, thank you. Um, <clears throat> and so actually this next step, uh, once this finishes resampling, we'll run it. Um, this is to do that. Um, registration. So we're doing the um, autofluorescence alignment. Oh, is it a sort of sample? It says it specifically here. Yeah, basically, we're aligning the two, the two channels. And so this is just an affine registration. We're not trying to do any like elastic registration where there's fine movements because we sh we're, there shouldn't be a reason that there, there should be local deformities between the two channels. There should just be like a rough difference in, in their position, if any. And so we just do an, an affine uh, registration. And this is very quick. And then the next step here is doing the registration to the template brain. And so in this situation, we actually do an affine registration first to get the rough positioning correct. And then we do an elastic registration where there's some local uh, movement in, in the tissue to sort of really match the boundaries and, and regions 
as close as possible. And th this process kind of looks at um, changes in contrast. So you can actually do this. I mean, for this data set and all the stuff using iDisco, we use autofluorescence, but things like DAPI or NUN have kind of like an opposite pattern to the autofluorescence. So you can use them just as well. Okay, so we've done the resampling. So now both data sets also have a copy as um, 25 micron isotropic. And if I now run this, see it, this will be pretty quick. And we can look in the folder to see how this is progressing. Like, <clears throat> quick question. Um, yeah, I don't know if you're going to talk about this or if, if if you mentioned it and I missed it, but. If you, let's say that you cut out the olfactory bulbs or something like that, or the cerebellum. Um, mm -hmm. And so I know that you have to change, let me just uh, turn my camera on so you can, um, I know that you have to change the, um, the number of slices based on the fact that it's a hemisphere. Mm -hmm. um, but if you um, cut out the olfactory bulb, for instance, and the cerebellum, do you also need to tell it that you've cropped some part of the, the brain in order for the registration to work? Or can you even do that yeah actually elastics is very um sensitive to like one if you've got some volume that's sort of not part of your raw data like the olfactory bulb is missing but it's there in the template some sometimes it'll be able to figure that out because the boundary of like the before the olfactory bulb like the, the sort of cortical boundary is pretty clear so elastics will know not to try and push you know some of those sort of um frontal parts of the brain into the olfactory bulb but um it, it's best to to really slice that back in the slicing step you really want to make sure this is um as close as possible to your data set um to make sure that you get a good result and so um i guess you can do that here within this initializing the alignment part you can actually crop part of the the atlas out and say that you're on yeah okay yeah so if you say you wanted to get rid of the olfactory bulb um you know, actually, let, you know, well, like, let me run the next step, which takes a couple of minutes, and then we can actually talk about this because, okay. um, all right, so, so here, this is the alignment step here. And I'll show you how to check this too, I like to check how, how the quality of the registration, but um, yeah, so coming back to this, so, okay, maybe we want to make sure that our, our um, template brain and, and annotations, we're not looking at the, um, olfactory bulb. So how we do that, we can go and look at the template brain. And so maybe, okay, maybe we're just imaging the brain from from here to here. Then what we could do is have a look. Now, where is it? So in image J, you can see where your cursor is. Um, it's actually positioned up in the top here, you'll see like where your location is. So as I move this, you'll see in brackets, the Y position there is 70. And then this one down here is like, you know, 358 or 359. So you could put those numbers in here. So you, you could come down here and say, okay, well, this is X, so I want to do Y. So I would say here like 70, 259 or whatever, whatever. So that way you're you're uh, extracting just that, that um, looking at just that part of the brain. Thank you. That, that was very helpful because what I did actually was I took the template and I cropped it, but I didn't need to do that. That was my. Oh yeah, that, that's, a, that's a solution I, as well, actually. I so. copied the template and I cropped it off, but I had a different similar issue. And that is, I hemisected the brains, and I thought I'd done it very, uh, like, cleanly and um, very kind of systematic for each brain in my set. But it wasn't, mm. because when I did the imaging, and also because you get kind of some artifact in the very surface of, um, of the brain, mm. then I had a variance in, like, let's say the first good quality optical slice 
of each hemisphere. And so I had to spend a lot of time finding that the minimal best quality slice in the mid area. Because mm. when I come when I came to do the latest statistical analysis, I think that the 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 aligning was okay. But then I had, for example, more sections of some areas. Do you have any like suggestions on how to deal with that? Um, the last bit, uh, like, could you elaborate on the more sections for different? Well, so exactly where the um, midline is, is where you've cut it mm. and how clean the image is in that first cut. And that mm. varied for me a lot across mm. brains or across hemispheres in my set of brains. And so I wondered if there was like a, a a more efficient way of dealing with, with it than the way I did, which was to mm. visualize every single brain in the set, every hemisphere, and then find the um, common medial quality section and limit my analysis to that. Have, have yeah, you this is... with anybody else, any other users? No, I mean, there's a couple of ways to approach that. I guess you know, one is like the sort of approach of like, manipulating the, the data that you're putting in by like just removing those sections but that could be quite a, a lengthy process the other way that um, could be a little bit faster is you know to go ahead with the i mean if you can perform the registration but the problem is more with the cells you could try and filter the cells out at, at the end so you could kind of say um you know at the end we have this big uh table of all the cells we could say that like the, the cell location has to be above this part of the brain to be included in the subsequent mapping and, and heat map and all of that sort of stuff. So you could sort of um, segment the, all the brains that way by sort of just like filtering the cell locations um, to ignore that part. Okay. Um, yeah, because the thing is that, that, that maybe it's changed with this newer version, but the cell counts are just absolute numbers assigned to a region in the atlas mm. it's not a density so if you have for example less striatum in one sample than another it's going to be an over representation compared to the volume mm. yeah you you do get the um so yeah what they don't provide and it's something that really needs to be written depending on the project you you get a raw um cells numpy yeah. table um which you could you, you can filter based on location and, and do a whole lot of stuff but really yeah the, the end and in fact in clear map too they don't really provide anything after the cell but, but I'll, I'll, um you know we'll get, we'll cover that actually if there's time like how to do all the the t-tests and, and mean images but they don't really provide that but they did in the original clear map paper um yeah but there's not really anything that's sort of written to let you dig into the data that way but it, it's certainly possible in python um to, to sort of look at you know clustering or look at not you know more specifically where those cells are located cell by cell okay. but you're right like the, the sort of final tables they generate are just kind of like brain region x this number of cells but you don't know what the volume of brain region x in that sample was oh right got it yeah so right. so that's, that's what you can also you, yeah if you have tissue missing in one sample versus another your counts are not really comparable yeah, that's a really good point. Um, so we tackle that in the pipeline for the confocal and the slide scanner, but it's not really done here. But you could, what you could do is write some part of the script to go back and measure the volumes. Because once you do this, um, once you've done this alignment, you know, once you've used elastics and you've done the alignment, you can do a reverse mapping where you basically put the annotation data set onto your raw data set. <clears throat> and oh. then you can say in this brain the hippocampus is you know x number of cubic microns and, and that way you could actually do a density analysis so so we do that automatically um in the, the pipeline we develop but you, you, yeah it's not actually in here but it could be written oh great could be that, done. that would be very useful great um yeah so th that may be something that we can explore <clears throat> yeah i definitely would like to extract volumes so yeah, I think, I mean, this is definitely beyond the session today, but what the sort of plan is, I know people are interested in projections. 
Um, and I think it's kind of useful just to have a mean intensity and a mean and a volume for these regions. Um, and, and, and the whole tracing and projection analysis is quite complicated and something for, for a different tube, but we would try and get some like a good combination of tools to do these things as well. Um, and I don't think that's going to be exclusively uh, clear map. It's going to be a couple of different tools. But, you know, once that's all put together, we can do a, like a workshop on how to use those. Thanks. Uh, okay. So I think we're, we're good here. So it, it, I think it, oh, maybe it's still, is it still going? I think it, it usually takes about seven or eight minutes to do this. Okay, we're almost there. So th if you like need to check, like this will be, where the elastics will, will run, there'll be a window pop up and, and usually it'll do a certain number of iterations at different resolutions. So it looks like it's just finished. <clears throat> um, and, and now that it's finished, we can check how things look. So in this folder, we started off with just the auto fluorescence and the CFOS. You can see we're starting to get a few different uh, data sets. One data set that's useful to check to make sure things are actually working is to check how the autofluorescence resampled looks. It should look pretty similar to, you know, assuming that the, the scaling was correct, it should look fairly similar to this image. And, and actually in this case, we are missing like the cerebellum. So we could have done some slicing to make it easier, but I know from experience, like Elastics can deal with this pretty well. Um, so if things aren't working, open this image up and just check, like, are they the same scale? Are they looking the same? Because if they're not, that could be something you've got wrong in, in, this, in the um, scaling parameters. And the really useful one to look at is um, the autofluorescence to the reference brain. So if we look in here, um, the very end here, there's a, a, a file called result raw. Um, the image you need to, or the file you need to open in image day is this MHD file. So if you click on this and drag it into Fiji, what you'll get is this is the template brain, but it's, it's um, the template brain sort of aligned to the raw data. And uh, if we look at, I just rescale it. <clears throat> so what we should find is that we can open this image, open up our resampled autofluorescence. And if things have gone well, we can merge these two channels. So I'm just gonna put our resampled in green and I'll put the result in magenta. And now when we go through, we should see like, so here just, Maybe it hasn't gone as well as it should. it's just, it could be a fainter. I think there's a fainter sort of layer. Yeah, so you can see there is actually tissue all the way up there. So it looks like it hasn't aligned, but it, but it has. And you, you should, like a good place to check, um, you should find these are kind of like a negative image. So you should see like where there's pathways here, there should be a negative space in the autofluorescence. So this is a good way to check how how well the registration is, has performed. So if there was bits missing from the brain or there was you know some damage or something like that, then you may find that locally that there may be like some inaccuracies in the registration and that, and that would be a good indication for you to, to know that, okay, like there was some damage here, the registration doesn't look so good. I know that my cell locations here aren't gonna be so reliable. Um, so it's always, I would always check this image for every brain just to have like some peace of mind that you know things are going well. Luke, <clears throat> if the registration isn't good in some parts, is there a way mm -hmm. of fixing that? Or, or are you just kind of like, you know, stuck with those results? Yeah, so there's not really a way of like manually correcting for this. So that once this registration is performed, this is how the cells and um, analysis is going to be sort of mapped into the annotation file. But you can play around with the settings a little bit. Um, uh, probably a bit too much for the tutorial today, but the files for modifying this. Um, oops. Probably in resources. There's, there, yeah, here they are. So 
in here, like Elastics works with these files that are just kind of like parameters. So mm. you can actually come in here and, and make some changes to make it more stringent or less stringent um, in how it performs these. So we've played around with these a little bit to sort of refine things for the other pipeline that we've developed. But yeah, so if you're not happy and you, you, you might want to change these, but in my experience, like, you know, the alignment works pretty well for the autofluorescence from the, the light sheet. Mm -hmm. right. And uh, if you can answer this quickly, I don't know um, if you know off the top of your head, if we wanted to load the hemisphere into the sample exactly like it is on that atlas with like the olfactory bulb on the top um, mm -hmm. and the cerebellum on the bottom, do you know which orientation that is or? Um, maybe oh, that... look, when, when you're on the light sheet? Yeah. <clears throat> uh, yeah, you know, I think on this, I'm not, I think, I'm actually not sure why they're imaging from the left side here, but the right side um, is the one with the mirror out. So it's actually the direct path. And so that's the one that I would recommend. Um, but if you wanted to image this way, you could just, you know, put the left mirror, just the mirror in. So you're imaging from the left side. Um, I mean, the way that we have the system aligned, both sides should be pretty good. You just want to be consistent. Um, but yeah, I generally feel like the right side is better because there's less optics. Um, okay, so we've checked the registration and the registration looks good. So now we're actually we're coming to the cell analysis. This is, this is a really important step. So um, you really, this is where you want to troubleshoot quite a bit to make sure that you're getting the cells that you, you think you're getting. Um, and in here, we need to change a couple of things so that this will work. This, the, you know, the, we've sort of looked at this already. The slicing here is like choosing a cropped part of the brain. And if we slice like this, we're not going to really get such a useful part of the brain. So the way that we can look at this is if I go to the CFOS channel, um, you know, maybe I want to look at something in here, or maybe I want to look at somewhere like closer to the surface of the brain where it could be difficult. I mean, in practice, you probably want to look at a couple of regions and really um, narrow down these settings because once you've got them in place, you don't want to be changing these things. I think it just as a bit of a, a side note, like for any of you who've looked at the CFOS data, uh, you know how challenging it can be. Like if you start looking carefully, you see a whole lot of other cells that are slightly more dim and like, the clearing parameters, the labeling parameters, the cell analysis parameters, there's so much room for movement in there. And so what you need to really do is pick some settings um, and try to do things as much as you can in parallel. So same antibody, same time, everything cleared together, labeled together, and then analyze using the same settings to try and control as much as you can for like just the ambiguity that exists in, in, in these sort of CFOS data sets. Um, and when you're sort of deciding on what parameters to use for, for counting, look at a couple of areas, maybe in a couple of different brains and really try and figure out um, what those settings are gonna be. So we, we can pick a region. So the way to pick a region is like, again, just look at the Z step. So if we just say like here, 600 to 800, and then if I look here, so this top corner is 160 to, um, this is actually 160 here, all the way over to 360. So if you look at where those nodes are and just click on them and look up here, you'll see like where you are in the image. <clears throat> and and that's, that's gonna be the numbers that you would use for slicing in here. Um, I'm just gonna copy in some slicing numbers that I know are good. And we're doing this on the stitched image. This is the full data set at full resolution. And actually here we want to, we want to turn the debug mode on. So what this debug mode means is it creates files with a debug in the in name in the, in the file name, just so it can discriminate between these sort of debug data sets and the real data set. So if I do this, it's just going to create a small file of this cropped region. Um, and, and here is all the settings for the cell detection and I think this is this is just you know if you haven't used Python before and you haven't used ClearMap and you're trying to do this on your own, this will probably just like you, you might give up because this is just completely different to what you need to get it to work. 
Um, and a lot of these things really need to change, but we can, first we can just run it like this, see how it looks, and then we can start to change things so you can see how to troubleshoot this. Um, so what it's gonna do is um, try, it's not doing any, uh, illumination correction is a correction for how, like any sort of um, changes in illumination on the light sheet. So there might be areas of the image that are always dark or always bright that we wanna correct for. It's not actually needed, so it's okay for this to stay as none. You, you really do need to do some background correction. Whenever you're looking at these images, and just to point this out, this is the case for most image analysis, especially in tissue, you're going to have background that's of a varying intensity. So here the background's really high, but in the middle, there's like not so much background. And so if you just try to detect cells with a threshold, so if you detect these cells, you're going to detect this whole region as, as sort of a, vo a volume rather than a, a cell. And so we need to do some kind of background correction. Um, so we'll get to doing that in a second. <clears throat> this this d threshold is saying, okay, everything above a certain intensity, that's what we're considering a cell. And so if we look back at this image, if I hover the cursor over this cell in image J just here, it'll show you the intensity of that pixel. And so you can see the background here is like 700, 600. This cell is about 1500 or so, maybe a little bit more, 2000. So that gives you an idea. We, we want the threshold to be above say 800. Um, I, I mean, I can even just put that in here now before, before I run it. Um, and, and this can be a little bit confusing. These processing parameters, this is an important part of cell map. This is how to use the resources of the computer to go as fast as possible. And so we'll make some changes to this in a second to make sure that it runs as quickly as possible. But for right now, we're just going to leave this. Um, I'm just going to run this. <clears throat> this will just take a, a few seconds. In fact, while we're waiting for this, we can even talk about how to how to think about this. So. Actually, it took me a little while to figure this out when I started to run this because I knew from the original clear map um, that we needed to do a few corrections to get good results. And when I tried to use these in here, nothing was working. Okay, actually, we can we can look at this now. So to do the visualization, uh, we use this sort of um, P3D plotting tool. If this doesn't work for you, um, so actually, it's it doesn't work all the time. It's a little bit buggy but if i run it now okay so it's working so i'll just quickly show you this and i'll show you what to do if it doesn't work for you so when the plotting tool works properly you should have a little bar down the bottom here that you can use to scroll through the data and over on the right hand side these are like scales for intensity so i can adjust the intensity and the green um, this is just a binary mask of every single cell location so if i zoom in and go through the stack, you can see, I mean, it's pretty clear that it's picking up a whole lot of um, false positives, but you can also see it's got sp spots inside the cells. So these are like our CFOS positive cells here, they've got s spots in them. <clears throat> so yeah, I mean, I was a little bit confused. Like you, you, we've increased the threshold, it's still picking up cells, um, you know, outside the tissue and everywhere what do we change to make this work? And so a, a good place to start is to, um, we could look, um, you know, one place to look when you have trouble with this sort of stuff. So the tutorial doesn't cover this too much, but there, there's oftentimes if a, the tool is good, or if the person who developed it cares about people using it, they'll have what's called an API. This describes like, every single module and, and what functions are in the module. And so if you dig through here, you'll find um, the cell processing. So it's actually underneath image processing experts cells. If you click on this, this is the, this is the function that we're running. So if we, if we look here, you can see detect cells um, using the parameters that we've set here. Um, and you can see there's lots of parameters. If you like, you know, spend a couple of minutes reading through this, you'll see what the parameters are. So like background correction, equalization, um, filters, and what kind of, what they sort of mean. So the maximum detection, what sort of shape the cell should be, what the, th the threshold should be. 
So spending some time here will actually give you a little bit of an indication of like how to how to use this, how to set the parameters. Um, but the other place to look is to actually go straight to. So now that we know where it is, I mean, you could have just found this by just searching for cells in here, but that we all just like spending a few minutes looking through this. It's a little bit painful, but you, you would find it. <clears throat> we can actually open that module up. So if I go back to spider documents, Im yeah, image processing experts. So, so you can see this is organized the same as in the API. And if I open up cells, the first part is it just loading in the modules that it needs. But then we have some like default parameters here. You can sort of see <clears throat> that this is like a dictionary. So there's like a, a list of variables and, and um, inside this, there's sort of a nested dictionary. So each one like illumination correction, background correction, they all have different parameters that we need to adjust. And, and the way, I mean, one thing you can see straight away this illumination correction here is actually spelled incorrectly. So if you try and use this, it's going to be looking for, for this, but in here it's actually called this. So if you wanted to use that, you would need to sort of correct this here or, or like mod modify the code so it's spelled correctly here. Um, so it's, it's really useful to actually come in and look at the module and see how things are spelled, um, see how things have been referenced because the documents sometimes aren't correct for this, but if you look in the actual module, you know what to type in to make this work. Um, and so coming back to our script here, um, we can start to actually change these. Um, so if we wanted to change like the illumination correction, um, I'm just going to start putting in things that like would work. So here we'd actually have to have something like, if we were going to use this, we would need to say illumination correction, then flat fielding, and then give it a, give the parameter. Um, so we, we definitely need to do background subtraction to make this work because you can see that there's that varying intensity that, that I pointed out. And so to do that, we can just put that in here. So background correction, we, we need to have a shape. So this, this shape, it should be bigger than the cells. Um, if you make it smaller than the cells, it's going to end up deleting cells. So this shape is something that will uh, basically get rid of the low frequency um, changing background and leave you a high contrast image of just the cell locations. And, and to make that a little bit more clear, I've actually left this in here so we can save, you know, I would turn these off when I finally run the pipeline. But if you're trying to troubleshoot this and understand how it's working, every, every sort of parameter, you can choose to save the output as a file. And that way you can look at it and see, um, you know, what it looks like. Um, we need to change the cell detection parameters. So I think, let's put this here. So uh, I'm using a slightly higher threshold here, but you could, I mean, you can change this. We, we, you sort of, you can see now how the thresholding works and you can look at the data and see how well the, the thresholding is, if it's too high or too low, if you're missing or over detecting cells. And the other thing we need to do here is put in the, put in the settings for Maxima detection. <clears throat> so maxima detection is looking, um, it actually works in 3D space, but it's looking at the intensity and just figuring out where the sort of brightest part of this sort of local intensity is. Um, and there's another parameter here, which is, um, it's actually talked about in the API. You can, if, especially if you start working, working at higher magnification, you know, when we're just looking at that low resolution data like we're working with here, the, the nucleus is just a few voxels. But once you start magnifying the image, the nucleus may have a couple of bright pixels within it. And so the, the fine maxima may start to sort of overcount cells. It may start to pick up two or three cells per cell. And, and you can suppress that from happening by, in the maxima detection, this is kind of a way of, of um, 
making sure that you're just detecting one cell for that whole cell. So these, these are the settings that should work. Um, and if we run this now, let me just get rid of this. So if we run this block, <clears throat> yeah, sometimes this can be a little bit sensitive. Let's, uh, let's see if it actually worked. Okay, if you have any trouble here, sometimes I have like this, these issues can come up with the cell detection. You don't have to run the whole thing again. So right now this kernel, the, the whole kernel's crashed here. We can just start a new one. We need to initialize the workspace. So it knows where those files are. We should run this one again as well. So it knows like how to slice the annotation. And then we should be able to come back to here. And I'm just gonna take this out. I mean, it should run, let me just try it. Oh. <laughs> This will take a while. We have to slice the data. Um, yeah, so if you don't run this, it's, it's gonna treat, the, it's just gonna try and analyze the whole volume. So this should be a lot quicker this time. Okay, so that was quick. Um, and now we can visualize this. And so you can see now we don't have any cells out here. Um, I crank this up a little bit. Oh. So if you have this trouble where it just disappears, this is, this is kind of glitchy. Um, you may have to run it a couple of times to get it to work properly. And I'm just holding down control to, to uh, a mouse wheel to zoom in. So what we should find is, it, it, you know, these ones look like, okay, maybe there's, the cell hasn't been detected here. But what we should find is if we go through the stack, there should be a de detection for it. So you want to spend some time going through and just making sure that you're happy with how this detection looks. Um, you are going to have some trouble, like, Maximum detection is not perfect. And so the background subtraction has helped us here. Actually, it's not too bad, but everywhere where there's kind of like this dense background, you may start to have false positives. The, the only way to really do a good job around this is to actually use some newer tools like um, using like a deep learning based segmentation, which has been trained to detect cells um, in these kind of different situations and then localize those cells. This is kind of beyond what ClearMap can do, but it's something that could be adapted into ClearMap quite, you know, with a little bit of work. Okay, so if you're happy with how that's working, um, what you would need to do, um, you need to make sure that you, like, if you're running it fresh, you would just um, not run this module. You would just comment this stuff out or delete it. Um, for us now, we could, we could probably just uh, copy this. I'm just going to turn off the debug mode. And in here, um, this is really going to depend on the computer that you're using. Um, the, the way, the really good thing about how ClearMap works is it uses multi-threading. So it will use multiple CPU threads to process the data in, in chunks or blocks. And that lets you process the whole brain in a very short amount of time. Um, and, you know, on this computer, we can do this quite well.
it'll let me paste. So th this is like, you know, the number of uh, processes to use um, and then the sort of size of these blocks. <clears throat> and you can play around with this a little bit more to get it even faster, but this, this works quite well on the workstation that we have. Um, I'm just gonna run this whole block now. Actually, just gonna run it. So I'm just gonna come straight down here and run this now with the new settings. So we get the whole brain analyzed. Um, this, this won't take very long, maybe five or six minutes or something like that. Um, but it's a good time to like answer any questions if, if anyone has any questions or thoughts about this. Okay. Um, yeah, so while we're waiting for this, I can, I can just talk a little bit about the, uh, how the annotation works. So because we've done this registration using the template brain, the other data set that we have um, is the annotation data set. And if we, we come back in here to the Atlas, we looked at the, temp, the reference or template brain. The annotation data set is basically the mouse brain. It's in the same um, space as this template brain, but it, now every single, um, Voxel has an identification number. So it uses intensity information to identify brain regions. So if you hover the cursor over here, you'll, you'll see the value or the intensity, and that's the brain region. So if this one's 507, so if I look that up on the table, um, and there'll be a, uh, there isn't a table here, but it, this, this JSON file is kind of like a table that, um, I don't know if it'll open up in here properly. <clears throat> It might be a little bit hard to read like this in this format, but basically you'll have a, a table that will have the ID numbers and um, it'll tell you like what that brain region is, what it, what its abbreviation is and what its parent regions are. And so that's what lets you, and this is like terrible to look at, but you know, in here you can see the different um, brain regions like layer six, you know, the, the abbreviation and there'll be an intensity number somewhere that helps you to map it. So once you've, mapped into this common coordinate framework, you can then start to ask questions like, okay, how big is that brain volume? Like how many voxels are there that, that are this intensity um, when I map this annotation image onto the, the real data set? Or for the cell analysis, when I detect the cells, when I map them into this image, I just have to ask what, what's the cell's intensity? And that will tell me what brain region it belongs to. Um, and if you need to look at this data set, it's a little bit hard to look at just by a grayscale, you can use like a, a lookup table. Glass Beyond Dark usually makes it a little bit easier if you're tr just trying to look at this and figure things out. Um, and the other thing to sort of think about too, um, you know, there's, there's actually a few atlases out there now as well. So this, this one is, there's some debate about how good some of the brain regions are annotated and, and people are using different uh, atlases. There's a, a nice one that um, we actually will talk a little bit more about in the, the workshop for the BrainJ pipeline that was from the Kim lab that, that actually does a lot better job of mapping some of the um, sensory and motor cortical regions um, and includes a, a bunch of brain regions that are quite interesting that are sort of missing from this Allen Brain Atlas. Um, you can see like some of the brain regions have kind of um, haven't been annotated so clearly. Um, <clears throat> How are we doing here? Did anyone have any questions? There's definitely some oddities in that um, in the atlas that's in the clear map um, hmm. resources. So you think it's possible to use a better one? Yeah, it would take a little bit of like uh, playing around to just make sure that uh, yeah, in this one, you need to have the adjacent file for the Kim Atlas, which it would be possible to make, but then it would just be a case of putting in the template file and the, um, and scaling, the, it, the, scaling it and then using it in the A5. Yeah, yeah, it would, it would be possible. I'm not sure if someone's done that already for ClearMap, but it would be possible. Um,
Luke, can you hear me? Yeah. Hello. Oh, yeah. Um, I have a question. Actually, I'm not sure how relevant that is. But for the cell detection, um, if we want to quantify something that is more cytoplasmic, and then we see all the projection of the axons, do you have mm -hmm. any idea on how we would be able to do that uh, to do some quantification that is more or less accurate? Yeah. So the projections is not something that's really covered in ClearMap, and in fact, the whole cell map. Um, well, the whole ClearMap pipeline doesn't really do this. They have a tube map pipeline that's really for vasculature, but people have used cell map to analyze projections. Is, is that what you're wanting to do? Mm, not really. It's just that uh, we are uh, having some expression that is not really new, uh, in the nucleus. And I was wondering how much that would be an issue for this kind of analysis. Oh, like, a, like um, virally labeled neurons, that kind of thing? Yes. Or, okay. Yeah. Um, it's a bit of a challenge because you have like the cell body and then you have the sort of axons and dendrites. And if you try and run a, a maximum detection, like we're doing here, you run into an issue where you'll have like a whole lot of cells localized along the axons and dendrites. Um, the only real way around this is to do some machine learning segmentation on the data before you process it. So you can actually use Elastic with the old version of ClearMap, but the new version of ClearMap, I'm not sure if that's 100% working. I'd, I'd have to double check. Um, but what you what you could do is you definitely make it work um, with the current with exactly what I'm showing today is take your data set from the light sheet, um, train Elastic so that you can detect the cell bodies versus the dendrites and um, axons, and then put the cell sort of cell detected layer from elastic into clear map, and you'll be able to detect the cells that way. Um, yeah, it's, it, it, elastic is a little bit much to go through in this session, but I'm going to go through it briefly next week. And then there's actually like a whole um, tutorial dedicated to using elastic. So. Um, you'd have a good idea of how to do it by, by, by joining those two sessions. Thank you very much. Um, and, and just in case anyone's interested for the other aspect of detecting axons and dendrites, there are some tools that are like are dedicated to doing this, um, but they're, they're, not, they're not clear map, but they are entirely different pipelines. But I know that some people have actually tried um, treating the axons and dendrites just as cells. So if you just detect maxima like very generously, so you would you know basically say that the shape would be very small. So you would be detecting maxima all along the whole um, neuronal projections. Then you can sort of start to analyze like a, you can create a heat map of, of where the cell, the cell projections are. So that's like one way of kind of hacking cell map to do neuron analysis. But hopefully like we'll, we'll develop something that's a little bit um, better at, at doing the full neuron analysis. Okay, so we, we have our cell analysis done now. So that you can see how quick that is. It's like five minutes, the whole brain is done. Um, and now we need to actually, the, the last steps here are actually pretty quick. So um, we can visualize this. I mean, let's just try and see if this will work. <clears throat> it's not so useful to look at because you, you have like tens of thousands of cells, but um, it's going to take a little while to plot them. It just will end up looking like a big blob that's sort of shaped like a brain. So it, this this sort of stuff isn't so use, useful to use when you when you're running the brains through this for your work. You would turn off all of these plotting tools. So you would just run the script um, without these modules included. Okay, so you you can see now uh, if I zoom out, we should see something that looks like the brain. Um, this big rectangle here or region, this is, I don't know why the data is like this in the example data sets, but you, you would have noticed it before. There's kind of like an image glitch at the top of the image here. So that that's what's being detected here as cells. And, and we would be able to filter that out based on where they're located or, or a number of other ways. But the data that you're getting from the light sheet uh, won't have this problem. Um, okay, so the first thing, we want to um, basically get some statistics on the cells. So this will create a, a plot uh, of all the cells that were detected. 
this is just X, Y, and Z. So um, how many cells like going from across the X axis, Y axis, and Z axis, this big one here that's out of this out of range of all the rest, this is that big um, artifact at the top here. Um, and then the ones that are more useful, um, the source, this is actually the intensity. So this can be a little bit confusing, but whenever you see source later on in the code, this is the intensity and size um, is, is this sort of cell sizes um, and we can threshold this I, mean, I think in the in the original cell paper I think they use like a threshold of say 20 to 90 as the as a, a as a cutoff for what they consider to be real cells and this is a very quick uh, this is just taking this data set and you're just excluding anything that's outside of this range so maybe things that are below 20 that's just noise um, and above 90 is is probably not a cell either um, and we could visualize that again if we want to, but it, it'll look very similar. Um, this step here is what the transformation. So we've done the registration, but now we need to transform these cell points into the Atlas space. Um, so we can do that here. And in, just so you can get a, a better uh, uh, sort of idea of that, we can look in here in the variable explorer. This, can, this is actually really helpful if you're like having trouble understanding what's going on. You can look in here. Let's make this a bit bigger. So here, like if I open this up, these are the coordinates. So this, this would be a cell. If I looked in the raw data set um, on the CFOS channel, if I looked in this voxel, there would be a CFOS positive cell. Um, and then this transformed. That's that's the uh, location of that cell in the common coordinate framework. So in these images. So basically, it's taken the cell from this image and mapped it into this space, so that we can actually measure its intensity. Okay. So this step here is basically doing that annotation. Um, and then we're st starting to save the results. Um, this is actually, a, we're almost through the whole pipeline now. I actually just wanted to mention a couple of things that can be useful. Um, let's just run this to the end and then I'll show you some things you can change. Um, the most useful thing for many of you will be just getting the CSV. So if we run this CSV export, I think most of the script here as it's provided works pretty well. So. If I look in our folder now, we should have an extra file. So this is our CSV file here. And if I look in here, this can be a little bit confusing to look at because the headers all have just letters, but this XYZ is the location inside the um, common coordinate framework. So if you wanted to plot these cells, you could. Um, S is the intensity, like I mentioned. Um, and then O here is the graph order. This is actually, this is really important. This can be really confusing if you just run this and you, you think that this might be the region ID. It's not the region ID. So if you start to try and make sense of this, thinking, oh, okay, 380 is this brain region and 367 is this brain region. This is the graph order. The graph order is like where the brain regions appear in, a, in like a hierarchy of all the brain. Uh, so this number is not actually so useful for what a lot of people want. You, you actually want the region ID and, and the abbreviated name is also quite, quite useful. Um, but, but in any case, like here you have like all the cells detected and you could plot them and start to filter them if you, if you wanted to and create summaries. So to get a little bit more useful information from here, um, I just modified this a little bit. So, and I'll show you, and actually what I'll do is after this, I'll post this online and I'll share like all the scripts and the changes that I've made. So you can just take those and use them um, for yourself. Okay, so in the cell annotation, I actually include 
a couple of things. So this, if we include a few more here, this will get us the ID and the acronym. So you know, a lot of people are used to just looking for brain regions using the abbreviated name or the ID. Um, so these are actually probably more useful for you when you have that CSV. So if you include this here, that'll actually make sure that they're recorded. Um, and then we just need to make some changes here um, so that they're actually going into the table. <clears throat> So this, I've just changed this a little bit. So now that we've got, we've got the names and ID actually being saved. So we can run these two again. <clears throat> Sometimes if, if something doesn't work, it might be because there's a file name that's been changed later on in the pipeline. So you might need to go back. I just had to go back here to the cell alignment um, and just run that again to make sure this would work. And now this one should work. And I think I don't need to change anything here. And yeah, so hopefully this is actually a little bit more useful. Okay, so yeah, now we have um, the graph order, but we also have the region ID. So, and, and this is the abbreviation. So these two are like what you were probably wanting to look at when you start to do your analysis. and, and from here, you know, you can go into what you're more familiar with if you're used to using MATLAB or, or, or another part of Python, or you want to even do this in Excel, you can, you can use this, this CSV file to do the analysis. Okay, the final parts, we're almost at four, but I'll, I'll quickly go through the voxelization. So this is a, a very um, quick process where basically every single cell that's lo um, located is voxelized. So it's basically made into a large binary sphere and those are added together. And so this creates a heat map. So when these sort of spheres are overlapping, you'll get in increases in intensity. Um, and that way you can start to look at where there's more cells versus less cells. Um, and so uh, the two types that it creates is a, a, just a normal uh, voxelization. And then there's one called a, a weighted voxelization. A weighted, it gives the sphere an intensity weighting. So based on this, this, the brightness of the cell, um, and that, that will create another heat map image. And that's basically the end of the script. And if we look at these images, let's see how they look. So this should be an image that's inside the um, same thing. It should be inside the common coordinate framework. It's a little bit hard to see, but if I adjust the brightness here and what, you know, people often look at these using a lookup table, like something like fire. So it's easier to see. Um, now you can start to see where there's a, where more density of cells are. So th this is a hal haloperidol treated cells. So there's a lot of um, cells here in the stratum. Luke, can you make that a little bit bigger, please? Oh, yeah, sure. Yeah, so I'm just sc scrolling through here. So you can see areas where there's more um, cell density. And if you hovered over this, then you, this would be the number of, of cells that would be in that sort of um, voxelized area. I think that it's seven, seven by 25. So that roughly 300 um, microns is the size of this sphere that they use. You can change that in the settings. Um, how, okay, so you have, yeah, yeah. Oh, uh, how do you see the annotations for that? Uh, how do you know what, what brain areas you're looking at? Right, so yeah, th this is kind of like where the, the pipeline ends, but it, it's not necessarily like, you know, you're stuck with this. What you could do is, um, so yeah, depending on how people, like I'm happy to go like a few minutes longer if people like want to see this and stick around. Um, I can show this and then I can also show the um, how to do the t-test mapping as well. That, that's very quick. Um, are some people interested in doing that or? I think the t-test mapping would be would be good. Yeah. Okay, yeah, I mean, so this is actually pretty quick. Um, what can we, 
if you need to see uh, first just very quickly if you needed to see the density for one brain region just say you can start to do image calculations so what you could do is um I'll try and do this just manually with image J, but you, could, you would probably do it with a script a lot easier. Because these are in the same space, if I was interested in, say, the density just in, you know, here, I can look at the thresh, the intensity is 672. I can set, I can threshold this. There's a number of ways of doing it. This is probably the fastest way for right now. So you could threshold this image just to isolate that brain region. So now we have just this mask. In fact, if you go to the Allen Brain Atlas website, I'll, actually, I'll try and include a link in the post. Um, you can even download these re brain regions as individual files. There's very small files that you can work with to isolate brain regions. But then what you could do is now these you have these two images. Um, you can need to make sure they're in the same space. So this image, same uh, format. So this is a 32-bit image. So just make sure you make this a 32-bit image. Just 8-bit right now. Um, and this this value needs to be one if we're going to we're going to multiply these images together. So um, this is two fifty five. So you can just um, you know do a process math. You would definitely do all this with scripting. But if I just subtract two five four, now that region there has just got a value of one. So what I can do is um, I can use an image calculator to multiply this annotation with the density count. Density count. Yeah, OK, so now we can we've isolated that brain region out. So you can see, like, we're just looking at the density in that brain region. So that was a little bit painful to do manually then, but it, once you've got those steps, it'd be, it'd be very quick to do. For, you could just make a list of the brain regions you wanted to see uh, like that. Sorry, no, um, very quick question. Is the brain ID, is a region ID equivalent to its intensity value in the... Yeah. Uh, yeah? Okay. It is, yeah. So the, 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 um, the intensity in the annotation image is the same as the ID number in the table. Okay, so like if you try and use ClearMap 2, um, you know you have to get this script working, but they don't actually provide any of the statistical um, tools to actually do the sort of um, group comparisons. But it's not too difficult to get working. Um, the information is there in the the API, so it's in this you know the website that I was pointing out to before, um, underneath there's uh, statistics. So just looking in there, I've put together, um, and I'm happy to share this too, so you can do this. It, there's actually not too much work. So once, so the way you would do this is you would make these these groups. You would take out all the visualization, and all you would have to change is you know you just need to refer it to the data set, run the script. It should take. 20 minutes or so per brain. So you can just, you know, there's even a way of just batching through the, you know, multiple brains. So it's much faster than the whole imaging process. Um, once you've done multiple brains and you want to do some statistics across different groups, um, you need to uh, use the statistics module. Um, and, and here I'm just telling it again, just where I have ClearMap installed, uh, where the output should go. I mean, you could make this a completely new directory. Um, and then you just need to tell it um, the locations of the density images. So we're used to, what we use for statistics are these uh, heat map images because they sort of show the density of the cells. 
Um, and once you've got a few brains, you can then start to do like, a, you can get a mean of what those brains look like. So you can start to sort of see what the average density is per voxel. Um, and then you can get the standard deviation. Uh, and then finally, what you can do is start to do a t-test across every voxel. So you can start to compare the groups and see if there's regions that are statistically more active or, or less active. Um, so to make the groups is very straightforward. You just need to point to every single brain folder where you have the density count file. Um, so this I've just done the analysis with the three example data sets for each group um, and just making these into a um, group. So basically listing the files, there's a, a read group function that just makes the group. You can run this to make a TIFF file for the mean images and the standard deviation images. Um, this is a very, very quick process. And if we look in uh, this folder, you can see that these two files have just been created. You know, just very quickly, if I open this up, what we should see is, is kind of something like this, but it'll be an average for the three brains. So now if we look in here, you can see it, it, it's similar, but now it's sort of mapping. This is new because it's from one of the other brains. It has like a different type of glitch. But you can see here, this is now an average of three. Um, and if I open this file in the background, that would be the standard deviation. Um, and finally, to do the um, statistical tests, there's a, a t-test that runs across all the voxels. Um, this takes a little while to run, but basically it'll get the um, P values for every voxel. Um, and then this function here colorizes the um, P values to, so you can see where there's an increase in activity or a decrease in activity. Um, and I just put this line in here so that it, it saves the file as a TIFF. So that, I mean, I think a lot of times this pipeline is working in NumPy, but I think for, for many of you, if you're, if you're used to working in TIFF, then TIFF is like a bit easier to work with in ImageJ um, or other programs. Um, and if I look in that directory now, we should have a file. And the orientation, I need to still change this to get the orientation. It's just rotated slightly differently. But if I go through here, oh, so the, these, uh, if you ever end up with images like this, where the color is they're interleaved, you can just go to image stacks, tools and there's a d interleave so we can just say that there's two channels here and now one of these stacks will be the um, negative and one of them should be the positive if i now merge these And this is now, this is actually back to front. The, this is where we've got that extra activity. It's a little bit difficult to look at, but if I rotate it at 90 degrees, you would, this would be the, the area that we're looking at in the brain with the higher activity. Yeah, so I might look in here and, and change the orientation just so it's easier for you guys to, to get this in a clear orientation when it comes out. But, but that, that's basically now, if you look in there, the intensity value is actually the st statistical significance. <clears throat> yeah, so that, I think that's basically everything that I wanted to go through. Does, does anyone have any questions that they wanted to ask? No, it, thank you very much, Luke. This is super helpful. All the different uh, components of this workshop was helpful. I'm hoping that there'll be many people here that are going to start using it and that together we can kind of build the tools out a little bit. Like, for example, mm. the statistical analysis is really limiting to like, a t-test only hmm. so that's something i'd like to be able to do is have you know some better factorial analysis for multiple groups and things so okay yeah i mean that, that's possible too i mean this if you look into the t-test voxelization function it's just using scipy t-test so if i mean i'm not so familiar with statistical tests but there's a whole lot of tests you can run in there so you know we could look in there and try and improve that that's definitely you know something that could be customized Great. Okay. Yeah. So, I mean, likewise, I hope that like more people use this and uh, yeah, we should talk more about this, like, and, you know, I'll definitely, I'm happy to share what we've developed in terms of the scripts that are working for this. Um, and then 
not soon, but towards the end of the year, we'll probably have another workshop where we look more at the like new, whole neuron analysis and some of the more complicated things. And and that may not be using ClearMap, but it may use some of ClearMap to do that. Yeah. And you said you have this this machine that's available. It's like a, you can book it and pay per hour of use or something. And and mm -hmm. how does it work in terms of storage? So we would just use. Um, like an external SSD or something? Mm. Yeah, it's not on iLab yet, but we can put it up there pretty soon. Um, and it would just be an hourly use. I think the rate would be something like $12 an hour or $11 per hour, it wouldn't be very much. Um, and then I think for data, you know, if you're inside ZI, you can map Ngram and, and transfer the data that way. But if you're working outside of ZI, like you could just bring a hard drive and plug it in and, and just, um, you know, copy the data that, that way. There's not a lot of storage on there at the moment, but I'll try and fix that so that we don't have a problem there. Um, and then for, if you want to use it, it would just be a case of reaching out to us and we're, we're setting it up as like, a, it's gonna be secure access through any desk. So there'll be like a, you'd have to like map your IP address that you're gonna to use to log into it um, and give you a password and things like that, just sort of make sure that it's very secure and. Um, but otherwise, it'll be very easy to use, just like I used it today. Great. This is super because I had a hard time transitioning from the previous version to this version because so many mm. things changed. The dependencies didn't work. And uh, mm. I'm happy that you've got this running in Python 3 because the previous one was in Py 2. Yeah. Different versions of Spider, different dependencies, a lot of the files didn't get updated. Yeah. Many of the modules didn't work. It was really tough. So. Yeah, yeah, it's it's pretty crazy. I mean, it was pretty crazy, like just first digging into it. So yeah, but it, it works. It works. So yeah, happy to share it. Awesome. Thank you very much. Okay. Yeah, you're welcome. All right. Thank you very much. Thanks, Luke. Appreciate it. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Luke. Yeah, pleasure.